uh, because it's this it's at this season where it's in the music it's in the fellowship it's in the decorations uh, it's in the devos that you hear it's the advent of Christ when <clears throat> when Christ when when God um, revealed his word in the flesh and so <clears throat> I wanted to present this in a way uh, through the month and I told Claudia because I I try to get these titles uh, to Claudia and I'm, I'm not good with it because uh, it's the hardest thing for me to do I don't know why it is but coming up with a title uh, so anyway I wasn't planning on this title but we ended up doing it so today's scripture was first Timothy 316 <clears throat> and it's the hope of Israel but really this is going to be the theme for this month and it's really been a culmination of all our studies so I want to say at the outset I'm going to present some material material here that if you're not in the studies um, you know you, you just kind of got to come along for the ride because uh, there's a lot of ground we're going to cover but today we're going to talk about um, in the next four weeks starting today um, the hope of Israel number one today we'll start with was foreknown this was not a mistake this was not there are some that believe you know there's no shortage of man's ideas of how we got here and where we're going and how do we decipher all of that well we have a word from God that that helps us on this journey and um, God did not wind up creation set it on in motion and then watch it and then say hmm I never saw that coming uh, nothing about God's plan for his redemption of man uh, is unknown to God it was all foreknown I know sometimes we as Christians struggle with the the chaos that we see in the world we say how can there be a God if all this is going on um, but that is uh, if you're not willing to get into that and flesh that out in the Word of God then uh, at this point uh, you know you're, you're always going to struggle with that <clears throat> God created man had perfect fellowship with him in the garden but man severed that fellowship and died and it set off God's eternal plan to redeem man and bring him back to life and so that was always foreknown we're going to talk about that today but next week we're going to get into the foretold not only was it foreknown but it was foretold God worked this plan out through history uh, and foretold it so that we wouldn't mistake it if we're diligent in our study and can come and reason with God through his word he is the only God there is no other God there are deceivers in the world there are powerful spirits in the world but there is only one God and he foretold everything and God tells his people always what's going to happen before time so that we're not disturbed by it if we're paying attention all right and then the third week we're going to talk about the fulfilled everything that God foretold he fulfilled in Christ Christ was the word made flesh Jesus was not created Jesus is eternal he is the creator and it was preordained and pre-purposed by God that at the right time in human history he would become flesh and dwell among us that's the advent of Christ and people need to know that and if we're confident about how we handle God's word then it will attract others uh, and God wants uh, everyone to come to this knowledge and come to this great light and then as Big Alan read for us this morning the final F so it was foreknown foretold fulfilled he was followed and that is the eternal plan of God that we would be reconciled to him and follow him and that following leads to our ultimate glory and so that was the reading as Paul put it to Timothy uh, this great 
mystery of godliness that has been revealed. Everything God foreknew, he foretold, he fulfilled, and we follow it. So today, I want to start in 1 Peter. And like I said, I, I have a whole lot to cover, and I'm going to shortcut it. So I apologize, because I'm just, I'm not going to make it. Um, my, my, <clears throat> my voice is just failing me. So... I'm going to preface this foreknown from 1 Peter. We're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1. But then we're going to let Paul um, explain this in a far better way than I could. And so we'll spend uh, the rest of our time in Ephesians. So if you want to just mark Ephesians in your Bible. Uh, but we're going to start here in 1 Peter. I had said before as we went through these letters that Peter, uh, his letters are really uh, Peter's take or like this Reader's Digest version of the Gospels. Everything that's written in the Gospels you can find in Peter in a very short way. And why does Peter write it? Because he wants everyone to be reminded one more time before he departs this earth uh, what our purpose is. Our purpose is eternal with God. And so let's look at this foreknown starting in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, I, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I just like the way it flows. Um, so often I know as I hear the NES be, be read from the pulpit here. Uh, sometimes the words get flipped around, but the, but the idea is there. Uh, but I have a heading, and I like the headings. Uh, it's called to be holy. And again, this was Peter's reminder of who we are. Uh, does this sound familiar? 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, <clears throat> preparing your minds for action. I would really like us to take this to heart, and I know we're doing that, and it's very exciting to me as we have these studies going on during the week, how this stuff is coming together, and as the word grows in us, the, our ability to communicate this light to others uh, becomes more evident and I believe we become more attractive and if we'll trust God he will use us and give us every resource to accomplish what he wants to fulfill in us uh, which is our final glory so he says preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And again, if you, if you um, would consider the time this is being written, I know for us, and I, I pick on Alan a lot about this because, uh, and Alice is not exempt, and most of us in here, we're baby boomers. You know what that means here in the United States? It means, in my humble opinion we're the most spoiled generation ever so when I was a kid it was the best time to be a kid because of the baby boom in this country the marketers marketed everything to my generation so we had the greatest toys and remember Saturday morning cartoons Claudia that I mean the, the cereal we had the best cereal we had the best toys, and there were toys in the cereal. I mean, it didn't get any better than this. Uh, but all the ads, I mean, all we had to do was play. I want that toy so we can play. And, and it was all about enjoying ourselves and having fun. Um, and then as the baby boomers got older, everything moved in our society with the baby boomers. You can track from toys, what from diapers and baby food to toys to fast food 
to uh, entertainment to car in industry to I mean you could track the whole um, marketing system through the baby boomers uh, so it was just it was just great but one I've been saying in our studies one of the things that uh, has been a real eye-opener for me is that in history and as we read these letters in the epistles um, most people in human history do not grow up having such a a, a fairy tale life. Now I know we all struggle, we all have issues in our lives, but for the most part, well, I had a pretty good life here. And my time in China was working with the generation there that is in the same position. Those, my students there, uh, and they're just wonderful relationships that continue to this day, but they're the baby boom generation. Every, so many generations before them struggled and lived our whole lives working in a way that we can't even comprehend so that there would be a time like this that a generation could just enjoy. Uh, and so I'm not condemning it. I'm just saying that the chaos that we're experiencing now, I think it's because the baby boom generation uh, did not pick up the mantle like the previous generations, though we're getting it now. As we get older, we're starting to see, oh my goodness, you know, there, there's work to be done and a lot of work, but there's good news. There's a great harvest out there. And so when Peter's writing this letter, he's not writing to a generation like that. They're living in a society that's just steeped in pagan idolatry and it's not just the Gentiles, it's the Jewish nation too. They're just not doing things that are pleasing to God. And those influences are all around him. And he's saying, you need to be obedient children, verse 14, and not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And you might say, Peter, what, well, what is this holiness? He says, since it is written, verse 16, you shall be holy, for I am holy. How do we know what holiness is? Only one way. God tells us what the standard is. And the world has a standard that insists you conform to it. And we're constantly being exhorted as Christians not to fall for it. We are called to a higher calling. Doesn't make us better. It makes us blessed. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways uh, inherited from your forefathers not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot now look at verse 20 this is the key right here he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for your sake the last times at the right time in human history, God came and became flesh and dwelt among us, John says. But he was foreknown. Peter preached this in the first sermon on Pentecost. He said this was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God that he would be delivered over and be crucified. It's in Acts 22 and 23. It's the way the sermon starts. Men of Israel, listen. Hear, O Israel, okay? Uh, this, this was not outside God. God was not wondering what was going on here. This was foreknown by God. And he's saying, he reiterates it here in his letter in verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. 
so it was the resurrection that confirmed for all time if the signs and wonders weren't enough what the resurrection did was pretty much confirm what Jesus was saying I am the life the eternal life and as we're reading in our study in Hebrews he freed us from lifelong slavery because of fear of death Satan's hold over us is because we fear what we don't know we don't know what happens when we die and Jesus says don't you be afraid of that I resurrected in my father's house there's many rooms and I've gone to prepare a place for you he's the bridegroom we've been talking about that during the week right he's the bridegroom and in Israel the bridegroom goes and right prepares in the father's house um, his betrothed and so ultimately when they have the ceremony he's gonna come and they will uh, they will dwell together and Jesus uses that beautifully uh, and says he's gone ahead of us but he confirmed it death has no power over him and has no power in, over anyone who's in him and so that resurrection gives us this hope in God in verse 22 having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have born again have been born again how is it that we're born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God so you have to be born again John says uh, in John 3 verses 3 through 5 in Jesus uh, encounter with Nicodemus Jesus says you got to be born again why do you have to be born again we talked about it this morning because when we sin we die and we sever our relationship with God and when we're dead the only way we're coming back to life is to be born again and the only way we're born again is to obey the gospel and the way we obey the gospel is to be washed in the pure water when Peter finishes that first sermon on on the day of Pentecost and he cut Israel to the heart and he said what must we do to be saved he says well you repent and be baptized every one of you you'll get your sins forgiveness forgiven and you'll get the gift of the Holy Spirit and he says the same Peter says baptism now saves you and it's not a, a washing but it's an appeal to God I don't have time to go through I'm not going to go through all the, the the passages there but what does it mean to be born again well he assumes you know that since he's writing to you the sanctified ones how are you sanctified you're washed you're made clean you put on Christ there's only one way to do that Jesus says unless you're born of the water and the spirit you have no part in the kingdom so since you've been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God and we get that by abiding in his word and I think 2,000 years removed uh, we have very difficult times uh, with people understanding what Jesus plainly says and what the Apostles plainly explain um, because the world has many ideas and they don't want us uh, to come to this understanding verse 24 and 25 but all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass the grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever and this word is the good news that was preached to you so they heard the good news they obeyed it they were born again um, but this was all according to the foreknowledge of God this was not an afterthought the forever kingdom was always foretold and it was accomplished in Jesus and it was God's eternal plan so turn over I think I can get through this let's look at it in Ephesians Ephesians gives us this wonderful view and for those who were in, in our studies here during the week um, it now I think as I put that as a backdrop we can't hear this enough 
And every time we hear it, it takes on a grander scale. There are, what I love about when we come together and we study is there are circumstances, we call the occasion for the, for the letter, the circumstances that Paul finds himself in where he has to write this letter. It was amazing to me, I'll, I'll give you uh, some of these examples in Acts as we see the church starting. Um, you see Philip go, go to the Ethiopian eunuch. In fact, let, let, we'll just take a look at this one. I wanted to. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. I'll just give you two verses. You don't have to go there. <clears throat> but Acts chapter 8, verses 35 and 36. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this, this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along, the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, now I bring that out because apparently the good news has something about being washed, being sanctified, being born again. And the eunuch recognizes that. The early days of the church. There was no doubt that there was something going on, like the Exodus, like God leading Israel out of Egypt. He led them out by a powerful hand. There's no mistake in it, it is God. The problem is that, well, is a God. Could be a God. There might be other gods. Um, now we know for sure that gods exist, because God is doing a mighty work. Uh, but God says there are no other gods. There's only me and all others are thieves and robbers. They're deceivers. Um, may, may, may deceive you with powerful works, but they're deceivers. So this idea that the good news, when it's preached, requires a response. But in the days of the apostles, there's miracles going on, and people are in awe and fear of what's going on. Uh, we talked about Wednesday night, Ananias and Sapphira. They got struck dead by the Holy Spirit because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Wow. And, and, and we're in Exodus, and we're, we're talking about Exodus when, when Aaron is set up as the high priest. He's Moses' older brother, and he's the first high priest, and then he's appointed, and his sons after him are going to be high priests because God said so. <laughs> he said, that's the way it's going to be. But his boys don't perform their duty exactly the way God wanted, and he kills them in front of Aaron. It's devastating. It was devastating to me the first time I, I read it, and, but it put fear in everybody else. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, and they're put to death. And, and you say, well, that's harsh. If I lie, am I going to be put to death? Uh, no. Well, why? Well, lying is a sin, and the wages of sin is death for sure. But they were witnessing the miraculous, and they weren't lying to men. They were lying to the Holy Spirit, Peter said. And so my point here is that there was a great fear and respect for God and his word at this time. So when in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and his companions are in prison and they're singing hymns to God and the Philippian jailer, uh, after the earthquake, the, the, the jail opens up and he's about to kill himself thinking that the prisoners escaped. And Paul says, don't take your life, we're all still here. And he says, what must I do to be saved? They, they go to his house and his whole house gets baptized. Why were they baptized? Because that's how you're saved. And they, he was in fear. I think the letter's written afterwards because we did it because we respected God, we feared God, but we don't have all the pieces in place yet. And it's true with us today. But these letters need to be written to tell them what did you do. In Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 3 through 5, 
Paul's telling the Romans what they did when they were baptized. You were buried with Christ so that you can be raised with Christ. And there's all these images, okay? In Colossians chapter 2 about the circumcision, not made with hands, but God did this when you were baptized. Uh, so this is where this takes effect. So this was according to this plan of God, which is why Jesus said when he goes to get baptized by John, John tries to uh, refuse him, and he said, you must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? I don't have time. Again, I don't know. I want to, but I'm not going to. We're going to Ephesians right now. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul writes as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints, those are the sanctified, the ones made holy, the ones who accepted Christ, the ones who were born again. Those are the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But they need a word from Paul because they need to get their minds around this. So it's one thing to do something. Uh, I know God exists. I want to submit to him because there's no other choice. But I'm not really sure what that means. And so now I have doubts and now I need to be instructed which is why we say baptism is not the goal, it's not the end. Being born is not the end, it's the beginning. So when we're born into this, now we gotta grow up in it. And now watch how Paul brings them along. Starting in verse three, he said, blessed be the God, this is Ephesians 1, chapter uh, 1, verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. The agents are all there. The agent is love. And it was foreknown before the foundations of the world, just like Peter said, that we were going to be ordained in him. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. I want to continue through, so I'm not going to chase this rabbit, Rich, this predestination. He's not talking about you don't have any choice. He's talking about the choice was always in Christ or not. It was Christ that was foreknown. And it was foreknown that anybody that was going to be in him was going to be part of this glory. So we'll leave it there. Um, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. That was the goal. God always wanted to reconcile us back to himself and that's how he was going to do it. The wages of sin is death. Flesh brings death. No other way. We're flesh and blood now, and we're not eternal, or we're not, we're mortal. Uh, I wish Bill were here, because this was a question Bill asked a couple weeks ago. It was beautiful. Uh, and you see, I can't let it go. Rich, it just keeps popping around in my head. But we have redemption. It was God's eternal plan to redeem man, but it had to come through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. I want to stop and comment, but it's, it's hard to break Paul's train of thought here, but Verse 8, he lavished on the, this wisdom and insight. And what we're seeing in our studies now, and I'm, I'm picking on Mary here because Mary is, you know, she's come alongside me and, and uh, she's in a lot of the studies now. And she, I think she sees what I see. How it just lights you up when you see how they all converge. We're, we're in Exodus, Romans, 
in Hebrews together, and they're all telling the gospel. Like the Ethiopian eunuch was asking about Isaiah, and he was preached Jesus, because uh, Jesus is everywhere. It's his word. But he says, this wisdom and insight, it's all there once we accept Jesus. The, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he says in 2 Corinthians, the Jews can't see this because every time they read the law, they're putting a veil over themselves. If you won't separate yourself from the law, the Hebrew writers are saying that's akin to you looking back to Egypt. The law says the Christ will come, and when he comes, you need to follow and listen to him. And anybody that doesn't is going to be cut off. But they're struggling with this because that's the system they know. And it's, it's comfortable even though, right, there are a lot of things we do in our life that are comfortable to us, but they're not good for us necessarily, but it's what we know. And sometimes we say and do things, I, I shouldn't do that, in our families. We, 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 we set relationships off knowing we're going to do it. Like, oh, I can't help myself. <laughs> Love is the agent. Love is the agent. He asks us to think first. He's given us wisdom and insight. He's made this mystery in verse 9 known. Um, it was according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things. Now, Verse 11, in him we have attained, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the gospel of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. I believe Paul is talking here about the apostolic ministry. But again, I'm going to set that aside for now um, but if you want to say it's the, the original church or the first church fine okay but he's saying we were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory the church is built on the apostles teaching the apostles doctrine and whatever they do sets a pattern for how it will continue which is why it's so important, Mary, why we're in this study in Romans. Like I said, Paul needed to address the issue in Rome. They were running the risk of breaking this church into a Jewish and Gentile congregations. And Paul says, at this time, you can't have it. He came, Jesus came for one flock. He took the dividing wall down. That dividing wall didn't just separate us from God, but it separated us in groups as people. And Jesus broke that barrier down, and we're not to put it back up. But they have miraculous gifts, and they're not using those gifts to benefit their brothers and sisters because they're having personality conflict. And he says, you need to get over that. We can't have that. Uh, so it was very important. Uh, but it was their teaching and then they had to strive to keep it together which is why now these letters take on so much more meaning as we go in when, when we start to analyze the, the occasion and the time it's not easy for us to do this it's very difficult I've challenged us to think like Hebrews when we're in the Hebrew letter um, and thankfully we're in Ak, I mean Exodus and so it helps but it's it's still difficult. I'm still a baby boomer American. <laughs> and so I, everything I evaluate comes through that lens of, you know, my history. But God is renewing us in our mind through the scripture. And now, uh, as Q likes, I know you like this verse, uh, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven. And there we await our Savior, who's going to transform us to be like him. Uh, but he says, In him, verse 13, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. <laughs> Who is, and he interprets it for us, 
<clears throat> verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, verse 15, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, which are the, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Most of these letters are written to help us love one another when we don't love one another. <laughs> the world is tough enough on us. You accept God and this standard and the world beats you up over it. We don't need to beat each other up. <laughs> We've got to find a way. We're commanded over and over again to love one another. Love. You've got to love the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand <clears throat> at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is the body the fullness of him who fills all in all it's in this church now that we're being built up as this living stones to be a temple where God wanted to make his home with us. And I'll just interject this. Exodus 19.6 was God's plan from the beginning, even for Israel, to be a royal priesthood. But it didn't work out that way. And then he set up the Levitical priesthood. But for us... We're what God intended all along. The church is the forever kingdom. The church is the eternal purpose of God. And if we fight each other, and we don't find a way to love each other, then that lack of love creates a hindrance to our learning. Who wants to come into a group where people give you a hard time? But thankfully, as the Hebrew writer says, I'm sure better things for you because it's not that way here, which is why I love my home here. Because it's easy to come together. Uh, and when we come together and we're patient with one another, we'll get this. If you stick with it, we'll get it. So he says, look, and I love how they break the chapters out, but he says in chapter two, he says, look, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Don't be deceived. That's real. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And I would say, I'm going to interject here, but I don't feel free like the Israelites in Egypt he saved us. We're saved. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. We're free because God made us free. But we're free to eternity. We're here to fulfill God's purpose while we're here. And oftentimes it doesn't feel free. And there's an antagonist that wants to keep us separated from God and keeps working on us. He says in verse 8, By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at 
that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostilities by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. It's really hard for us to get our minds around that, and it's almost impossible, I think, for us to imagine at the time these letters are written, the I think if you've ever been to a, a, a motivational meeting, the very inspiring, I mean, like where you think, I can do anything. <laughs> you know, if you've ever been in those meetings, you're like, yeah, I'm not a quitter. I'm going to fight to the end. Uh, and then you leave, and you're like, I'm not so strong. <laughs> and the first one that tells me no, I mean, flattens me right out. Um, it, it, it's... We could say, yeah, God, I get it. I'm in. I'm all in. But then our flesh kicks in. And we're not as strong at doing the things that we say we want to do. But he knows that. He came, verse 17, and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What a beautiful image. But here's what I wanted to get to, and we'll close it out with this. This is the first 13 verses of chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly but beautifully. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been now revealed to us, his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery, again and again and again, is that Gentiles are fellow heirs. You see how much a struggle this was? Members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I just want to say here, this is at a time, and we're looking at this in Romans. Um, how can these Romans be my brother and sister when the Messiah was supposed to come and kill them? It's a real struggle. My view of things, and not God's view of things. But verse 7, he says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan and mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. You see, the eternal purpose of God was to reconcile one people, one flock, that would be his ministers in the world to bring the light to truth. So this foreknowledge, this foreknown of God is now yours. And as we come together and as we put the pieces together and fit it all together, 
he can't help but beam it out there. But we need to be patient with people who may take a long time. Nobody's going to take longer than me. <laughs> and so I really, my heart is for people like Ron. I'm so looking forward to this memorial next week because Ron is a kindred spirit of mine. Uh, he accepted things that were that took me a long time to accept. Uh, I cry just thinking about it. I don't wish my path on anybody, and I certainly drive a lot of people crazy. They can't let this go. But I'm going to tell you guys again this. If you will stick with this word, it will never disappoint you. Whatever people say, you come back to the word and, and make sure it's God's word. And to have someone like Ron come along in your life and to share it and have him fleshed out, say, yep, can't argue with that. It's pretty satisfying. But look, here's a season laid out for us. This was all foreknown by God. So we'll look at the foretold uh, next week, but enjoy it. You see, see what I can do when I only have a little bit of time? I just lost on her. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. We have an invitation song. As we sing this song, uh, make your requests known to God, and if need be, make them known to the church as we sing together. <laughs>